Blog Talk Radio. Well, here we go, ladies and gentlemen. It's an early version, birthday bash. It's Tuesday, November 14th, and it starts out in Cleveland, Ohio, with a brother, a mentor, and a friend to me, the American Sports History Podcast, hosted by Peter Ray. Here's Chewy Mark Mancini, 2,500 miles to the west of him, where the temperature has hit 70 degrees again, seven straight years. So I'm happy. Thank you, God, on that one. 347-205-9631. If you haven't missed the show, 30 goes by quick. Blogtalkradio.com forward slash Mancini Sports Podcast Platforms. Remember to subscribe to the podcast powered now by Mancini Media. So without further ado, more him, less than me. Let me lay the red carpet down, put the podium in place, hand off the mic. Peter the Three. How are you? How can people get hold of you? And you're bringing this great guy in each month, man. It is like clockwork. I'll take it away, my friend, as I man the boards. Hi, Mark. I'm doing well. I have a YouTube channel. It's my name, Peter J. Rea. You're absolutely right. Tonight's guest, another night of once a month NFL history. He's the author of four sports books, uh, Bench Bosses, the NHL's Coaching Elite 2015, Art of the Dealers, the NHL's Greatest General Managers 2017, Lords of the Gridiron, College Football's Greatest Coaches 2019, and the book we're going to talk about tonight, continue talking about tonight, Lords of the Gridiron 2, Pro Football's Greatest Coaches 2022. Uh, in 2026, he's got two books coming out, Baseball's Greatest Managers and the NBA's Greatest Coaches. Welcome to the show, uh, Mr. Matthew DiBiaz. Ah, uh, Peter, Mark, it's so great to be back, man. What a day, man. What a day. I can't wait. Let's let's do it, baby. <laughs> Very good. So let's get into it. You, you, your book's about the top 50 NFL coaches of all time. We're at number 30, Hank Stram. What can you say about him? Wow. I mean, if for a lot of people growing up in the old days, always around Super Bowl time, they would uh, show the NFL films clips, you know, those half-hour episodes of the highlights of all the Super Bowls, man. And of course, always Super Bowl Four. Hank Stram, one of the first coaches to be wired for sound, and oh, what a performance he put on! I mean, to this, and when whenever he years later, you know, whenever he walk in an airport, someone would shout out to him, "Hey, coach, 50, 65 toss power trapper. Hey, coach, keep matriculating the ball down the field." And, I mean, it's it's just a classic. It's one of the great moments in Steve Sable in NFL films. I uh, just, it was nonstop chatter all throughout Super Bowl four. And it's just, it's a part of, you know, pro football iconography there. And, and he, Hank Stram, the late Hank Stram was the greatest head coach in the 10 year history of the American football league from 1960 to 1969. He was the only coach to coach every single game, exhibition game, regular season game, in the AFL uh, and during its 10-year history from 60 to 69 before it merged with the NFL in 70. Uh, he won more games than any other AFL coach, won three AFL titles in 62, 66, and 1969. And, I mean, from, and he was literally the first head coach in the history of, of, the, of the Kansas City Chiefs, even when they start off as being the Dallas Texans and then, when they moved to Kansas City in 63 to become the Chiefs. I mean, he was their only head coach until finally he got fired, you know, in 1974. What, I mean, what an array of innovations. One of the most innovative pro uh, coaches in pro football history. He came up with the moving pocket, something he had developed when he was an assistant coach at Purdue, which he, which he used, uh, you know, uh, with uh, like future uh, AFL coach, uh, quarterback, you know, uh, Len Dawson. He designed it, a moving pocket. Uh, he, he was one of the first coaches to use the double tight end formation. He was also one of the first coaches to use like the 3-4 defensive formation. And uh, He came up with the power eye formation where it's an eye formation, but you pull the tight end from the f- offensive line, you put him in the backfield, and it caused incredible confusion. You know, where's the strong side and where's the weak side, but, you know, especially with the safeties because they have no one to key to. You know, and especially this, like the this weak side linebacker and the strong side linebacker, it created a lot of confusion. It was he, he developed that. Um, and what happened is that Stram was born in 1923 in Chicago. And actually, Stram is not really his true Christian name. He was born Henry Wilczek, Jr. And his father was a professional wrestler. And what his father did was 
he anglicized his name to Stram, and, and basically the family name was changed, and that's how Hank that's how Hank got his last name. He was always Hank Stram for the rest of his life. He was very small. He was very short. In fact, one of his pet, the pet nicknames his chief players used to call him was Little Caesar. So he was he was short, but what he made up in a lack in uh, height, he made up for in uh, just he was a brilliant student and a, uh, just a great uh, academic IQ and a great uh, sports IQ, and also absolute enthusiasm. He was just constant motion, just constantly. Constant activity. I mean, he could do it both academically and and athletically. And when he finished his college education, he was playing. He was playing football at Purdue. His his head coach there, Elmer Burnham, said saw, saw Stram saw his genius and said, "I want you to get into coaching." And then right then and there, Stram got into coaching and never looked back. And so for like the early 50s, he was doing a lot of assistant coaching stints uh, at Purdue where he, he recruited a young Len Dawson and, 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 and used the moving pocket to help improve his passing. Then he was doing assistant coaching work uh, at uh, SMU and actually tried for the head coaching thing in SMU, but you had to be a, but the thing was Stram was Catholic and this was a Protestant city. And so hey, they, they said, no, thanks, but no thanks. And then he was doing assistant coaching work at Notre Dame and then at the University of Miami. But after a while, about after 12 seasons of assistant coaching, Stram still wasn't getting any offers. And he was seriously thinking of quitting, quit, quit being a coach. He actually wanted to start up a sporting goods store with one of his brothers. I think it was in Florida. And then... In December of '59, he's at a sports banquet in Florida, and you know he's there, you know, on the dais there. And all of a sudden, an usher comes up to him and said, "Mr. Stram, there's a telephone, an important telephone call for you." And so Stram leaves his seat, goes into the rear of the building, accepts the phone call, and guess who it is? Lamar Hunt, the founder and future owner of what was then called the Dallas Texans, and eventually became the Kansas City Chiefs. Lamar Hunt was starting this new pro league, which was rivaling the NFL. He needed a head coach. He had reached out to a couple of guys. He reached out to, like, Bud Wilkinson in Oklahoma and, get this, Tom Landry, both of whom turned down the offer. So he goes to Hank Stram, and Hank Stram signs on the dotted line, and his, and his ticket was made. I mean, he literally started the team from absolute scratch, and – uh the first two seasons, they finished in second place to the Chargers. And then in 1962, he puts it all together. He, he, he was weak. This was that quarterback. He had a great running back in, in Abner Haynes. He was able to get Len Dawson, who was, got his unconditional release from the NFL. He had played five seasons, strictly as a backup, had a lot of, ring, had a lot of rust on him. And he just took him on faith. And he worked with them, and by the end of tra tra training camp, Len Dawson was the starting quarterback of the Texans, led them to the first place finish, their first divisional title, and he helped them win the 1962 AFL championship game. It actually was good for the AFL. That's the one that went into overtime. It was like the longest football, pro football game ever, and it was won by a field goal by Tommy Booker there. And it really it was a it was a real attention getter. It helped get the AFL some media attention, you know, and viewers and all of that. So it was very beneficial. But the thing was, though, the Texans were competing with the Cowboys, and they just weren't drawing enough fans. And so finally, Lamar Hunt decided to move the team to Kansas City, where they became the Chiefs, and there they and they remained ever since. But the three seasons following '62 was basically the team was in rebuilding mode. Um. Uh, the Chiefs got like future greats in Buck Buchanan, Otis Taylor, Minnie Mike Garrett, uh, Ed Buddy, and uh, most of their offensive line, and, and a bunch of and a bunch of other guys. You know, defensive players too. You know, Bobby Bell and, uh, and others. They were in rebuilding mode, and finally, finally in '66, they put it all together. Win the AFL championship. They beat the Buffalo Bills to win the AFL championship, and they were the first representatives to represent the AFL in Super Bowl one and they lose thirty five to ten because basically the Packers exposed some weaknesses in their defense and their secondary. So from sixty eight and sixteen from sixty seven, sixty eight, the Chiefs again go into rebuilding mode and basically what Stram did was rebuild his defense. Um, 
from his starting 11 in 66, he replaced seven of his 11 players. And by 1969, he has one of the best defenses in not just the AFL, but in all of pro football. I mean, he had Curly Colt, Buck Buchanan, Aaron Brown, Jerry Mays on the front line. He had Bobby Bell, Jim Lynch, Willie Lanier, one of the great linebackers in pro football history, a great secondary. And in 69, even though they finished second in the division behind the Oakland Raiders, they still get a playoff berth. And in and and, and three postseason games against the Jets, against the Raiders, and against the Vikings, they only allow 20 points in 12 quarters of play. And they win all three games, and they win Super Bowl IV. And it was Hank Stram's greatest moment. And then, unfortunately, after that, he never got that high ever again. I mean, I mean, I was talking to Michael Oriard, who played for the Chiefs in the early 70s, and he said one of Hank Stram's biggest mistakes was that he got too conservative with his offense. And also, he stayed with his veterans much too long. I mean, by 72, the teams were just practically doddering. They were just old and hurt. And they basically, for the rest of this, it wasn't until Marty Schottenheimer came along that the Chiefs became a viable franchise again. And finally, in 74, Stram got fired by the Chiefs, and he was getting into, he was doing broadcasting work, and then in 1976, he, he, he was hired by the New Orleans Saints. But the thing is, he only coached for two seasons. The Saints were so pathetic. Actually, it kind of cost Tank Stram. He lost points, according to my rating system, he lost points in his career value. It damaged his average season rating, and it damaged his regular season value. So actually, if, had he not taken that Chiefs job, I mean, that Saints job, he would have probably finished higher in the Pantheon rather than the 30th spot where he occupies right now. But he was just, he was so innovative. I mean, another one of his innovations was the 4-3 stack defense where the linebackers, instead of lining up in the gaps between the linemen, they lined up behind the linemen in a camouflage formation. And it was very effective there. I mean, uh, they would just, it would confuse the, the, offense, the guards because they didn't know who they were going to go after then because there were these gaps there. It was, it was very good camouflage, and it, it worked effectively against the Vikings in Super Bowl IV. I mean, Joe Cap later said after the game, he said trying to pass through the, the Chiefs' coverage was like trying to throw a football through a redwood forest. The, uh, now, uh, from your book, you, you quoted Bill Krishner. I do remember, I remember Hank Stram well doing games on the radio, and I loved his, uh, you mentioned his enthusiasm. He was with, he was with Jack Buck, the father of Joe yeah. Buck, who is still cur- who is current, current announcer. Um, yeah. So anyway, I love, yeah, I have fond memories of Hank Stram doing games on the radio. In fact, I was in Europe uh, listening to a play, uh, Browns playoff game, and he, he, he was doing it, I think it was on um, military radio. You quoted Bill Krischer about Hank Stram. He was such a disciplined guy, I can see him now. He always put the program in his hands and would swat it back and forth. He was a real gentleman and really a fireball. He wasn't very tall, but he was a, he was a real excited coach during the game. Hank was really a nice guy. He would walk up and down the sidelines, watching the game intensely while having everything under control. Now, you mentioned his, his star quarterback, Len Dawson. It's hard to believe that he was a bench player for five years, including two years with Cleveland, which doesn't reflect well on Paul Brown's judgment. Another uh, quote, Hank Stram was beyond that, however, creating an atmosphere of racial harmony that helped his players forge bonds that broke through racial barriers and created a gridiron brotherhood that helped the Chiefs overcome adversity innumerable times and achieve championship glory. Michael Oriard said, quote, Hank is a very different coach in all kinds of ways. Hank Strand's greatest achievement was being at as close to colorblind as you could be as a white coach in those days. Kansas City was the first pro team to have a majority of black players. It was the first team to have a black middle linebacker. Black and white players were not segregated. They roomed together if the dictates of the position so determined it. Race didn't count in Kansas City, while it counted in most other places in those days. I think Hank Stram deserves great credit for that. Uh, let's see, some other stuff about him here. Let's see. Uh, yeah, you. Uh, oh, you mentioned how he, he had Frank Pitts. Uh, he played for, I remember him playing for Cleveland. And then uh, another quote, Hank Stram radiated, radiated energy throughout the game. When the final gun sounded, was carried off the field on the shoulders of his players. That's after he won the Super Bowl, proving yeah. once and for all the AFL could play against the NFL on equal teams. And as I, yeah, you mentioned from 1978 to 95, he was doing games, Monday Night Football games. Tremendous. Yeah. I have very fond memories of Hank Stram. Now let's move on to Mike Ditka. 
Wow, my dick! What a what a what a fireball! I mean, one of the he's a member of a very rare club. He, along with Tom Flores and Tom Tony Dungy, and I I don't know if there's uh, any other <laughs> one or part of that club, but I know at least those three guys. One of the few men ever to play on a Super Bowl winner as a player and also coach a Super Bowl winner as well. Because Tom Flores did it, you know, uh, he he was part of the uh, Super Bowl four Kansas City Chiefs that won the title there. Then he coached the Raiders to two Super Bowl titles. You know, Ditka uh, won a Super Bowl title with the Dallas Cowboys in Super Bowl six, and then of course the Bears, you know, to a Super Bowl victory. And then Tony Dungy played with the, the Chuck Knoll Steelers as a player, winning a Super Bowl ring, and then coaching his own Super Bowl winner in the mid two thousands there. So at least those three guys. I don't know if there's anybody else. I have to. I think maybe Ted Kubiak. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I have to check that again. But I know at least those three guys have done did it both times as a player and as a coach. Dick uh, came from Western Pennsylvania. I mean, he was born in Carnegie, Pennsylvania, which is a Pittsburgh uh, a suburb. Actually, Dick, uh, the way it's spelled, D-I-T-K-A, is actually not the way. His, uh, it was not his Christian name. Uh, his actually his real last name is you spell it D Y C Z K O Polish Ukrainian immigrants. But the thing is, uh, and that Ditka is literally the phonetic pronunciation of how uh, uh, of his of you know, his uh, Polish Ukrainian last name. It's the phonetic, and that's what the family used. You know, just it was simpler that way. And um, he grew up in. He actually he was very puny, considering what a fireball he became. He was actually quite sli- puny as a child. He wanted to play football, but his coach sent him away. He said, I'm afraid you're going to get hurt. So what Ditka kid did as a kid, he wanted a strenuous physical fitness program. I mean, he was trying to eat nutritious foods, trying to bulk up his body, you know, make himself larger. And finally, after a lot of years of preparation, he was at the right size and strength. And, and finally... <laughs> He was a three-sport out athlete at his local high school in Aliquippa, and he got, and then he got a football scholarship at Pitt. And I mean, he was he earned All American honors. He was just an absolute top-notch player. I mean, he he, he was like a coach on the field, and also there was no slacking around him. I mean, he, he, the coaches didn't have to chew out a player if they didn't if they screwed up on the field. Dicker would do it for him. I mean, he just he was absolute high intensity. Then he was drafted. Uh, both by the Chicago Bears and the Houston Oilers, uh, and was it in 60, uh, 61, the Ditka went with the Bears because uh, the Bears were more prestigious. And he, along with John Mackey and Pete Retzlaff, were literally the prototypes of the modern-day tight end position. I mean, making it, you know, not just the, you know run blocking, but also as a pass catcher and a playmaker and being a big gun on offense. And like in the 1963 season, he made a big catch in, a, in a, a late season game against Pittsburgh that helped the Bears maintain first place. And then in the 1963 NFL championship game against the Giants, he made a big catch that helped the Bears get very close to the goal line and set up the game-winning score for Chicago. But his relationship with Hallis was not exactly perfect because Hallis was very much a tightwad when it came to paying his players. And finally, Dick, uh, who was never really tactful when it came to talking to the press, made that infamous remark that uh, uh, he would throw nickels like uh, hubcaps or something like that in Hallis to teach him a lesson, traded him to the Philadelphia Eagles. It was punishment. You trained him from one of the best teams in the NFL to one of the worst teams. And for a time, Dick was in exile. Then finally, was it um, seven? I think it was 69 or 70. The Dallas Cowboys acquired Dick, uh, and Dick uh, helped them make Super Bowl appearances in Super Bowl five and in six, winning winning uh, the Super Bowl with six with them. And in fact, he was like a, one of the signal because Tom Landry would call the plays. He would use his tight ends Pettis Norman and Mike Dick to shuttle him back and forth, relaying plays to the quarterback, who was ch- uh, Chuck Morton and later Roger Staubach. So in a sense, Dick uh, was kind of learning how to be a coach. I mean, because, you know, okay, what plays do you use in certain situations? And then when Ditka retired, was it 71, 72, he became an assistant coach under Tom Landry at Dallas. Uh, he was working with special teams. And, in fact, one of his moments is uh, at, you know, the opening kickoff in Super Bowl Ten against the Steelers. It was Ditka's idea that Hollywood Henderson 
field the ball on a reverse and, and run it up the field. And, hey, Hollywood Henderson went on this big play. The only person who got to him was Roy Jarella, who knocked him out of bounds. I mean, if it weren't for Jarella, Hollywood Henderson would have gone all the way. That was Dicka's idea, to go with that reverse in Super Bowl X. And he was still assistant coaching. And then finally, in like the late, late 70s or early 80s, he wrote a letter to Chuck to George Hallis, Papa Bear George Hallis, saying, if you ever – have a need to use me as a head coach or as a coach, I'd like to come back. And finally, was it, uh, was it 81, 82, uh, George Hallis, yes, he said, I want you to be my head coach. And he took over, and, it was, and slowly but surely, it was just he painstakingly rebuilt that team. Uh, you know, he, he, get, he has Jim McMahon at quarterback. He, he's already got Walter Payton. He gets Jim Cover, you know, on the offensive line. He's got he's got the defense already. You've got Singletary. You've got Mike Singletary. You've got Richard Dent. You've got Steve Mongo, Steve McMichael. You've got the uh, 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 Doug Plank. Uh, all all those guys, you know, who became part of the '46 defense. And you've got Buddy Ryan there. And basically, uh, Mike Dick inherited Buddy Ryan. And oh, the tension between those two. I mean. There was no love loss between those two. I mean, when I interviewed Doug Plank for this, for this book, Lord to the Great Iron Two, I mean, Plank really got into chapter and verse about the tensions between Buddy Ryan and Dick. I mean, it was like they were like a, a separate, a, a separate state within a state. I mean, they rode on their own step. They took separate buses and all of that. I mean, it was just Buddy against the rest, actually the rest of the world there. But the 46 defense was just, was so devastating. I mean, it was just, it was just basically a total aggressiveness. I mean, and today you couldn't have it today because the, the, the rules against hitting against the back of the head, hitting the quarterback, this and that. I remember one documentary. One of those guys, Plank, said we would have been banned. We all would have been constantly suspended or banned for dirty play and all that because. <laughs> it's just, that's how rough it was. I mean, he said Buddy Ryan had a rule. If the bear, if a Bears player intercepted a pass, the other ten guys would not block for him. He said the other ten guys' job was to go after the opposing quarterback because on an interception, the the quarterback is now a blocker and you can do whatever you want with them. So Buddy Ryan said, the guy who has the ball, you're on your own. The other ten guys, kill the quarterback, kill him, you know, find him and kill him. And he said it got so opposing quarterbacks if they threw a pick and they saw it they would run for the sidelines like joe montana and those guys they would run for their lives because they knew what was going to happen to them if they stayed on that field <laughs> I mean, that's how crazy it was and finally um the rebuilding process by 84 they make their first playoff appearance and i mean they win divisional titles from 84 to 88 they dominate the nfc central and then finally, in 1985, one of the greatest single-season performances in NFL history, 15-1, and one, and they just they go all the way. One of the great – I mean, they just annihilate everyone in their path, the Rams, the, 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 the I think it was the Giants, the 49ers, and then they take on the New England Patriots, and it was no contest. I mean, after New England kicked that opening field goal, I mean, it was just total, absolute humiliation and domination of the Patriots. And the only set, the only fly in the ointment is that Walter Payton did to, didn't get to score a touchdown. That's the only fly in the ointment. But it's still one of the most dominating performances. But the tragedy of it all is this is a team that should have been a dynasty. They should have dominated for the rest of the decade, but they didn't do it. And one of the reasons is that after that Super Bowl title, Buddy Ryan left the team to become head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles, and his successors at defensive coordinator – took the 46 defense, and they just no longer went with it. They just started becoming ordinary, just using what everyone else was using. And, and essentially the Bears lost their zing. They, just, they lost their zing. They lost their zang. Yeah, they could win divisional titles. They could earn playoff appearances, but they couldn't go all the way. Jim McMahon would get hurt, and that would impact on the, uh, on the offense there. I mean, eventually Walter Payton retired. I mean, just uh, it was just, and also after that Super Bowl victory, uh, everyone, including Mike Ditka, succumbed to the disease of more. They were 
focusing on cashing in, again, appearing in movies, appearing in commercials, and they were losing focus. And Dick Demosk of all, he was losing focus too. I mean, he used to get on the players, oh, you're being distracted with all these outside interests. But, hey, Dick himself was getting distracted too with his outside interests. He was doing restaurants. He was doing commercials, this, that, the other thing. And then finally, the team just kind of fell up, it just, uh, stopped being a, a, a powerhouse and in 92 – they let him go. I mean, I, I mean, I mean that. I remember watching on TV his final presser there, and all he did was uh, speak the lyrics to, you know, Frank Sinatra song "My Way," and you know he was doing TV work, and then he made an abortive comeback in 1997, just like Hank Stram. He co he tries to be he becomes head coach in the New Orleans Saints, and for three seasons the Saints are absolutely lousy and in the same case as Hank Stram if he had if Ditka had not taken that head coaching job with the Saints he would actually would have finished higher than 31st he would have probably met, finished I think with a 25th or something like that much higher in the pantheon but taking that Saints job it killed him in his career value it killed him in his average season rating and it hard, damaged him in his playoff value and also his regular season value yeah, Mike Dick, uh, the, the 85 Bears, I think, are definitely one of the coolest, most memorable teams of all time. And Mike Dick uh, is one of the most, you know, it is entertainment. And Mike Dick was an, a very entertaining, uh, charismatic coach that, uh, and, and that we all enjoyed. Uh, he talked, you now a quote from your book, Mike Dick uh, took over a team that had a talented roster, but precious little coaching direction, whipped it into shape, with the same unrelenting firebrand intensity he brought to football when he was one of the premier tight ends in the NFL during the 1960s, leading them to their first Super Bowl appearance ever in Bears franchise history and winning their first NFL championship since 1963. They talked about him in uh, college, and they said uh, he was such a maniacal player that his coaches prevented him from scrimmaging for most of the practices because they didn't want Mike to hurt himself or his teammates. Yeah. Hard to believe. Now, he had a great quote that George Hallis throws around nickels like manhole covers. Yeah. That's <laughs> tremendous. It, yeah. Yeah. That's it, yeah. It's part of and, NFL folklore, and it's true. He was. He was a tightwad, Papa Bear, very much a tightwad. <laughs> then you have a quote from Doug Plant. I think there was such a love in Chicago from the Hallis family for Mike Ditka as a player and the history he had with the organization as a player. Mike Dicka changed the whole organization. He was not just the head coach. He came in and he realized this whole team was in quicksand. He came in with an attitude and a determination like you've never seen. Coach Dicka was about your frame of mind, your mental attitude, how you treat your teammates, how you look at a football game for four quarters and not just one or two, and never stop, never quit, and fight to the end. And that was the attitude. Now, you mentioned... Uh, you mentioned uh, Jim McMahon again, uh, the quarterback. It was another talking about another entertaining guy getting in trouble with Pete Rozelle for wearing uh, these yeah. uh, these um, headbands that had thing, things written on them. Jim, Doug Plank, Jim McMahon was like a, Mike Ditka as a quarterback. He would roll the dice. He would throw his body out there as a blocker every day and every play. Jim McMahon was exciting, totally exciting. And you know what? He had the complete support of the defense. He would come off the field, and the defense would bang heads with him. This was our man. This was our guy. Uh, now, you mentioned, and then the, the quote, you said, the, the Bears' confidence in 1985 was so high that they recorded the infamous Super Bowl shuffle music video one more month before they even reached the playoffs. Yeah, talk about a memorable team. Mike Ditka, another quote. He remains a living symbol of the NFL's fierce, unrelenting, underpaid, overachieving, unforgettable past. Iron Mike Ditka was and always will be a true monster of the midway. My, so, uh, well, we we have one minute left. Uh, uh, Matthew, uh, tremendous interview tonight. Uh, do you have any final words uh, for our audience? My, uh, yeah. Matthew DiBiase. Yeah, later tonight I will be uh, 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 putting up another episode of my show, The Package Tourist. I'll be posting it online so after 10.30 p.m. tonight, so pay attention and have fun, okay? Wonderful. Uh, wonder, another wonderful uh, podcast, NFL History Tonight, Hank Stram and Mike Dicka. Thanks so much, uh, Matthew, for another wonderful show. Thank you so much, Peter, for everything. It's always an honor and a privilege to be on this show. 
Oh, I love. I, I always love it. Especially tonight was great. Hank Stram and and Mike Ditka. Four weeks from tonight, we'll have Matthew back, and we'll talk about Jimmy Johnson and the Cowboys and the Dolphins and John Parbaugh and the Baltimore Ravens. Next week, we'll have the starting center fielder and leadoff hitter for the coolest MLB team of all time, the Oakland A's from the early 1970s, Mr. Bill North. Dear listener, may the road rise to meet you. May the wind be at your back. May the sun shine warm upon your face and rains fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand. Good night, everybody. Thanks again so much, Mr. Matthew DiBiaz. Take care, Peter. God bless you. God bless you. Right. From Cleveland to Kanya, Norwalk to Newton Falls, Snowpack is working to keep your natural gas and electric rates consistently affordable. We are 240 Ohio communities using our collective strength to buy in bulk, and then we pass the benefits along to you. From Avon to Alliance, Springfield to Sebring, it's a partnership that's been working for more than 20 years. We're working to help you keep more of the money you earn, from buying energy in bulk to sharing energy saving tips that help you reduce your energy usage. And we're working with our member communities, too, on important projects that save energy and improve lives. From Tiffin to Trumbull, Ashtabula to Athens, NOPAC is committed to helping you reduce your energy costs. For two decades, we've kept utility rates affordable for hundreds of thousands of residents. Just imagine what we can do together in the decades ahead. Learn more at nopex.org. Wars are fought by adults, but they destroy childhoods. At Save the Children, we focus on what matters. Children in the U.S. and around the world are facing unspeakable hardships from war, poverty, and the climate crisis. This giving season, your gift will be matched five times to help more at-risk children. That means a gift of $5 will become $25. A gift of $10 will become $50. Donate now at SaveTheChildren.org.